Hi everybody, welcome to the 6th episode of Revit API plus Python series. Finally, we're gonna start coding. I want to show you how to structure your code so you can run your tools with PyRevit and develop some sort of template to begin with. Everyone might have different coding styles, so everything you're going to see is the way I personally code my tools. Also, we're going to make a new tool together to add levels elevation to their names. I will explain it more later in the video. But let me know if you like this kind of coding tutorials. So, let's begin. I will come to my PyRevit extension and create a new panel for naming tools. Then inside, I will create a button folder here and call it levels elevation push button. Inside, we need an icon and Python script. I'll drop that icon right here and create an empty Python file. Now we can open it and write our code. Inside of this file, first of all, we need to add this line exactly how it's written here. It has a very special syntax and it's telling Python to use UTF-8 encoding. If you won't add it, you might get an error if you are using another language with special characters, like used in German or many other languages. Then we're going to start our script with some metadata. The bare minimum that I use in my tools is title and doc string, so let's create them. I will call my tool add levels elevation. I'll try to leave as many comments as possible for beginners. Then the doc string is a description of the tool when you hover over the button. If you have a look in my tools, you will notice that I describe a lot of information in my doc strings. I'll paste it here from one of my tools, and this is how it looks in Revit UI. Usually, I give some overview of the tool, then steps how to run it, some information about last changes, and I like to keep my to-do list here as well. And lastly, I put my name. Then, depending on the script and your goals, you can use more. I'll bring PyRevit docs about script anatomy so you know where to read about them if you want more. This is a really good written docs and it has a lot of examples. It even has an example right here that we can set up different title, docs and other stuff for different Revit languages. We just need to use a dictionary with special abbreviation of the language for the keys. I'll just scroll through this in case you want to pause the video and read more about any of them. Or check the link in description. Now let's add them to our script. I'll write author with my name. And help URL is going to be my YouTube video. I'll make a reminder to update this URL once I publish a video. Help URL is the link that's going to be activated when you hover over the tool and click on F1. Then I want to highlight this tool as new. With this tool, we can specify the minimum and maximum version of Revit to run this tool. If you want your user to select something or open a specific view type to be able to use your tool, you can use context. We just need to pass here class names, and then user will have to select these elements of these categories. We won't need it, so I will just comment it out. You can also limit your script not only to certain categories, but to a specific view type or Revit file. Let's go to the website we had opened before about script anatomy. There is a link to bundle context, open it, and you will have more examples on how to use it. Now you know where to look if you need it. Since we are done with metadata anyway, there is only engine configuration left. The next block we are going to type is imports. I like to sort them by categories. I'll bring some random modules as an example. First, I place all my regular imports and imports from Revit database. If you're just starting out, always import everything from Revit DB. It will make so much easier for you with autocomplete. Usually when I'm done with the script, then I go back here and instead of importing everything, I import only the classes that I actually need from database. I don't think there is a noticeable difference, but I like to keep it clean. I think I misspelled right here, therefore I didn't have any autocomplete options. Then we can bring some modules from PyRevit. Since I try to reuse a lot of my code in my library, I also make a custom imports. If you look at my folder structure, you can see that there is library file. And in snippets dot underscore selection, there is a function we created last time, get selected elements. To bring it in, we have to write from snippets dot underscore selection, import, and the name of our function or classes or variables we want to bring. Sometimes we also need to make .NET imports. If we're dealing with special .NET lists, we need to use CLR model to bring them in. Mostly, we will only need to use this list import because certain functions in Revit API wants to use this as an input. For example, if you look in Revit API docs to change our selection Revit UI, it tells right here that it needs I collection of element ID types. So I will code a little snippet to show you how to use them if you are new to this. Let's imagine that we have a Python list of valid element IDs. Then we need to create a list of element ID types. To add elements there, we need to use that add function instead of append, as we usually do with Python lists. Or we can just give our Python list in here and it knows how to react to it. Then I will change my Revit UI selection with this line. Since this is just an example, I will delete this whole thing. We are done with the imports, let's declare the most common variables we're gonna use across all our scripts. You'll often need doc, UI doc and app for your tools. Also I use path to the script of in my codes if I want to create some report files or point to a XAML file for GUI. Alternatively, you can import these three variables from pyRevit.revit. Then I like to place my global variables here. It's convenient to have hard-coded values on the top of your script if you want to modify them quick. We're going to add it a little bit later when we will be coding our tool. 
Then make some space for local functions and classes. And the last one is the main. This is where we're going to be coding our tool. Before we continue, I want to organize this space a little bit better. I'm going to bring this website and now I can write here import and copy this whole thing. Then we'll go to my script and I'll place it here on the top and comment it out. Then I will create this sort of separation line. Now we can do the same thing for variables. Let me paste the same things for all of these fonts as well. Now when you scroll through your script, you can clearly see which block is made for what. This is very helpful when your script becomes very large. It took a while to explain all of this, but now we have a template file that we can use to start our scripts. I'll modify it a little bit and post it on my EF Tutor GitHub repository. Check the link in the description. Finally, we can create our tool. But first, let's brainstorm together to break it down into smaller steps to, so it's easier to code. Usually, I do it quickly on the paper and I rewrite it multiple times until it makes sense to me. Sometimes I also can do it directly in PyCharm using comments, and these comments will become steps that I need to code one after another. Flowchart is another good option, but they were not the right approach for me. However, I will use them in this video so I can visually show you the thinking process. Then we will transfer it to PyCharm and continue it there. So let's begin. I will open draw.io in my web browser, then create a new diagram. There are multiple templates here, but I will create one from the blank page. So the idea of this tool is to get all the levels in the project and add their height elevations in meters to their names. So it's easier to search them in the project. For example, you can see here that one of the insulation floors is placed wrong. I can just check elevation of the slab and then I can find the level with the same position. So we're going to start by getting all the levels in the projects. Then we will need to get their height. Since I know that all the internal units in Revit are given in feet, I will need to convert it to meters. Then we can also add our rounding here as well. Then we can combine level names with elevation together and rename them. But if we would stop here, then every time we would run the script, it would keep adding it over and over and over again. And that's not what we want. So before renaming, we need to check if elevation already exists in the name. Then depending if it's true or false, we can add elevation or update elevation value. To make it easier for us, we will use the special symbols. And we will need to get the value between them and replace with a new one. Let's declare symbols somewhere in the beginning. And lastly, it's good to report all the changes to the user. This will make them aware of what levels has actually been renamed. Then for those of you who would like to practice Python a little, have some homework. You can add controls for elevation position to choose between suffix and prefix. And then another good feature that you could add is to be able to remove all elevations from your levels. It's good to be able to revert all your changes, especially if you run this tool and your beam manager won't be happy about it. I think this diagram is ready, let's organize it a little nicer and create an image out of it. And now based on this, we can create these steps in our Python script. Let's go back to PyCharm and I'll create a comment for each step so we can write them one after another. Let's start coding. First we need to declare variables for our start and end symbols. I'm going to use this unique character I found online. So we will generate this kind of height elevations and add it in the end of our levels, or even in the beginning. So I'll remove this example line and let's move these two lines to our variables block. I'll move this line on the top as well. For the next step, let's get all the levels in our project with filtered element collector. We'll get it with built-in category and filter to exclude level types. Let's bring Revit API docs and have a look at filtered element collector. You can see here different methods that we can use with this collector. For example, we used of category, we could also use of category ID or of class and so on. This is probably the most used class in the whole Revit API, so you need to get comfortable with it. The next step is to get level elevations. Let's iterate through our list of elements with for loop. And for each level we need to get level elevation. Let me open Revit to show you where to look for methods and properties available for different elements. If I select this level right here and go to add-ins tab, click on Revit lookup and snoop current selection, we can look behind the scenes of what's possible to do with different elements. In this case, if I scroll down to level properties, there is elevation that returns a value in feet, even though my project is set up in centimeters and meters. So now I need to convert feet to meters. I can just divide it by 0.3048 to convert it to meters. Sometimes you might have some difference in rounding compared to Revit's method. So I prefer to have it exactly the same value. Let's scroll up to our functions block. I'm going to write a function that will convert internal units into meters. We will reuse it for a lot of different tools for sure. We will need to provide a length parameter in here, then create a doc string to describe our function. Try to make it a habit to writing these doc strings. It might be really helpful. I will go ahead and warn you that there are different methods before and after Revit 2022 to convert our units. So firstly, let's see what the Revit version user is using. We can get it with app.versionNumber and make sure that it's an integer. Now I need conditional statements. If Revit is below 2022, we can use unitutils.convert method. 
Let's open Revit API docs and have a look at unit utils class. You can also see that there are many functions are obsolete. And this is the change that happened between Revit 21 and 22. We can use this convert method. We need to provide three arguments, value, current units, and desired units. Notice that we need to use display unit type to describe our units. And right here it says that it's an enumerator which means that it contains different objects inside of it to describe units. Let's complete this part right here. Provide length, then display unit type with decimal feet as our current units, and display unit type with meters as our desired units. If you want to use different units, you can change it right here. Then starting with Revit 2022, we still need to use unit utils class, but we need to use another method. Let's go to Revit API docs and find unit utils class again. And look at its convert method. And in here, it wants to use forge type ID for our units. There's also a new method convert from internal or to internal. Then we just need to provide our value and desired unit. So if I go back to our script, in here, we actually have to use unit type ID enumerator to get our units. Since I want to reuse this function, I will add this function to our library because I want to reuse it in the future script as well. So select and copy this whole thing and create a new Python file underscore convert.py. Then paste it here and now I need to make sure that I have all the imports and variables. Let's go and copy paste Revit imports, encoding line and app variable. In the main script go to the custom import section and import this function from convert file. And then don't forget to remove this local function in here. So let's continue. Remove this line right here and let's use our function. If you click on Ctrl Q in PyCharm, it will show the documentation of the function. If this is empty, then you need to reference your library in your Python interpreter. Check my Revit API autocomplete video on how to do it. Provide level elevation to this function, then we can round it here to the second digit as well. Then let's convert it to a string, and I'm going to add a plus if the value is the positive. If you're not familiar with conditional comprehension, the single line is the same as if we write it out in these four lines. I'm going to keep it as a single line, so I'll delete this. So this step is complete. Next we need to check if elevation is already added, so we won't keep adding new values in the end every time we run it. So exist means that we need to update value and otherwise we add it as a new. So let's make this one first. We'll add our symbol to elevation height and combine it with its name. I'll mark this as to do and I don't need that comment anymore. Make changes to our Revit projects, we need to use transaction. This is a protector of your Revit project, so you control when you want to modify any elements. First, we need to declare it by providing doc variable and name of the change. Then we need to start and commit it. And our changes have to be between these two statements. I also use try and accept statement in case there will be any issues. We can change level's name by overriding its name property. Place your transactions outside of your loops, so it provides you better performance. Also right here we can report if level was successfully renamed. It will not reach this line if there will be an issue with renaming. Let's run it in Revit and see if we get any error messages. That actually worked pretty well. I can see that I have forgotten to save the name of the level before changing it. Let's create current name variable and print it instead. Cancel our previous run and try again. This time it reports correctly. If I keep clicking it, it will keep adding this elevation in the end over and over, and that's not good. So let's do something about it. We can use simple replace python method to update it, then we need to know what is the value between the brackets. I'll make a new local function for that. It will need text, start and end symbols. Then I'll write a doc string. And we can use string slicing to get the value. We just need to get position of the start and end symbols in the level if they are both present in the text. Also, don't forget to add the length of the symbol for our starting element, so it's excluded. And then we can return our text slice. You can google python slicing if you are a python beginner. There are multiple websites describing it. We need a conditional statement for a fail safe in case we provide a text without the symbols in it. Then we'll return an empty string. Also right here type hinting. This tells python that these three arguments have to be a string and it also returns a string. Otherwise it will raise a warning. Return to our main code. Let's make a check if both symbols exist in the level's name. Then we can get our current value in the brackets. We will replace it with the current height. So this step is also done. Let's go and test our tool again. So we run it and it creates it. And on the second time it should update these values. Move our levels and run it again. And it added it instead. Something is not right, let's have a look. Okay, I think it makes sense. We made an if statement for this part, but then it will always add elevation in the next line because we have forgotten to declare here one as well. Just add conditional statement right here and it should be good. 
go to Revit, undo your last changes and run it again. And now it actually updates these values. So finally, the script is finished. So let's clean this up and add some steps for your homework if you want to practice your Python. This is the place where you can add the feature to remove elevation from your level's names. You can create a variable mode and add a conditional statement for controls. It's good to be able to reverse your changes if your BIM manager won't be happy about the results. I will also publish this complete tool with custom GUI in my EF tools extension. Check it out. I then create another control to put elevations height as the suffix or prefix with position variable. I'll also add my main statement. This is the special syntax. You can Google about it, but it doesn't affect how our script runs. Let me clean up some comments. Then I would also move these variables to our global settings in our variables block and add a final printing statement saying that the script has finished. Let's run it last time to make sure that we haven't broke anything while cleaning. I have just realized that it's only supposed to report levels that had a new name. Before changing our levels name, we need to check if our new name is different from the current name. Let's make this final change. And this time it's complete. Now you can see what levels you are actually modifying. Hope after watching this video you will get a better understanding of how to make your own custom tools with PyRevit. I'll be making other videos explaining certain topics in more depth, so stay tuned. Also thanks to my Patreon, who support me on a monthly basis. If you want to see more content like this, consider becoming one as well. My name is Eric Fritz and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.